Amen. Amen. So we welcome you um, to our 10th part of the Bible study, part 10 of the Doctrines of Grace. We welcome you to part 10 of the Doctrines of Grace. And as I was praying and said, this is two and a half months, two and a half months of, of Bible study. And we still yet to come, more yet to come. Um, I think we probably have two more of, 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 of um, sessions, sessions of Bible study um, before we move on to something else. Um, and I pray to God that this Bible study has done for you what it has done for me. Um, it, it has blessed my heart tremendously. Um, and I believe when we get to the last two parts of Bible study, we will truly come to see how this has blessed us, um, you know, truly. Um, so although we are in our 10th part of the Doctrine of Grace, part 10, we are on part two of irresistible grace, which we also call effectual calling effectual calling, that God's call is effective, that God's call is irresistible. And as I told you last week, some will say, some, um, the, the, most, uh, the most effective line, or, or so, they, so people think, or the most popular line that people have brought forth against the doctrines of irresistible grace or effectual calling is that they say, I don't believe that God will drag people kicking and screaming against their will into the kingdom of God and at the same time prevent others from coming who desperately want to be in the kingdom of God. And as I said last week, you've heard this before. In fact, you've thought this before. I've thought it before. Uh, when I was fighting against the doctrines of grace, I don't believe that God will drag people kicking and screaming against their will into the kingdom and at the same time prevent others from coming who desperately want to be in the kingdom. Well, what we say is this statement, this, this statement is, biblically speaking, is totally false and the Bible stands against it. And, 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 this, and this statement is false for two reasons why we say last week. I'm not going to go through all details, but I'll just share that with you. That this statement is false for two biblical reasons. The first reason is the inclination of men's heart. The inclination of the human's heart. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that the inclination of the human heart, that um, <clears throat> you could not get to the verse, Mark, uh, uh, um, that the Lord saw. It's not, it's not anyone else who sees it, but the Lord saw that the wickedness of the human race had become, uh, uh, race had become on, on the earth. And that every inclination, not some inclination of his heart, it's not like part of us are good, and part of us are not good. It's not some of us, not 10% or 99% or 1%. It's every 100% of the inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil sometime. No, not only it's every part, but it's all the time. So no one is, no one is willing so the Bible is debunking that the fact that there is someone or a person who's willing to come into the kingdom of God, to accept the things of God. No, uh, the inclination of our hearts is evil all the time. Every inclination of our heart. And we said that was the first reason. But there is a second reason. And the second reason is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says, the mind governed by the flesh, um, no, that's not the second reason, that's still the, that still has to do with the first reason. The mind, no, it's okay, it's okay. No, no, it's good. 
The mind governed by the flesh is hostile toward God. That's, in, that's what happened with the inclination being evil. Now it turns our heart to become hostile toward God. It, it, our heart does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It does not submit to you must be born again. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God because our heart, every inclination in our heart is evil all the time. But the second reason is what Romans chapter 9, verse 16 tells us. That even if it was not so, even if it was not so, even if the inclination of the human heart was not evil all the time, even though we, even if we could have pleased God, when it comes to salvation, even if we human beings wanted to desperately come to the kingdom of God, we would not be able to. We would not have access to the kingdom of God. You know why? Romans chapter 9, verse 16. Romans chapter 9, verse 16 say, what does it say? Um, can somebody, can somebody, I, I could paraphrase it, but I don't remember, remember it totally. Uh-huh. Romans 9, verse 16. Romans 9, verse 16, anybody? Go ahead. Go ahead, Angie. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Yeah. So even if we, de even if we desperately wanted to come in the kingdom of God, this is not how you find access to God. It's not of the one who wills. It's not how much you want it. All right, NG, what does the text say again? Say it again, please, for me. You don't have to turn it off. Mike will pause you. It is not because you so desire. In fact, Jesus said that in John 3 to Nicodemus. You know, this is not of, it's not, it's not, it's not of the will of the human, like, or your parents. It's not because, oh, your father's pastor, so therefore, Jeremiah, you become a, you, be, you are born again. No, no, it's not of human, it's not of not, it's not of because you were born of somebody who's Christian. It's not because you even will it. The way God plans salvation, it is only through God's mercy you can receive it. So the thing about man, human being kicking to come into the kingdom of God is debunked by the Bible. The other one is that, oh, well, is God going to take people that are screaming and kicking into the kingdom of God? We say no. The reason God's grace is irresistible and God will, God's grace is reasonable and will not have to drag anyone kicking and screaming into heaven. You know why? Can somebody take a shot at that? Do you know why God's grace is irresistible and those he will drag into heaven, those he will bring into heaven, he doesn't have to bring them in kicking and screaming. Anybody want to take a shot at that? No? Because it's only by the Holy Spirit that okay, you can even you're not, being Yeah, you're not too far. You, you, you hit it right on the nail. Because the Holy Spirit is accomplished the mission he came to accomplish. That's the reason why the grace of God will be irresistible. That's the reason why the calling of God will be effective because the Holy Spirit is right now accomplishing the mission he was sent for. Then what is the mission of the Holy Spirit? That's what you would ask next. Jesus told us what the mission of the Holy Spirit would be in John 16 verse 8. 
In John 16, verse 8, the Bible clearly lay out the mission of the Holy Spirit. When he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict. Um, this one's a proof, but he will convict the world to be in uh, um, to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Let me read it in the other in the other translation. And when he comes, he will convict the world uh, regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. But you said, what you say, Angie? Okay. No, I'm stopping there. Go ahead. You wanna you wanna add? Okay. No, no. Say no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is sin. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, the reason why I didn't add that, and I, that's good. The reason I didn't add that is because I wanted to emphasize on this, that the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world. It's meaning, apart from the Holy Spirit, what does that text is saying? No one would be convicted of sin. Because our heart is what? The inclination of our heart is evil all the time. And, 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 and our mind is desperately wicked. And our mind is governed by the flesh. So we would never, we would die and we are, we're dead in our sin. We don't know any better. And now while we're dead, we don't know any better. So it, it, we would, other, would not otherwise be convicted to come to salvation apart from what the job, the mission of the Holy Spirit. When somebody's convicted, what does that mean? I'm not talking about they are convinced. It's not that, oh, no, they become convinced that Jesus Christ. No, when you convict somebody in the court of law, you pronounce them guilty. And they're going to have to serve their time. So now what the Holy Spirit, he makes the Holy Spirit make us realize and know that we are guilty before God. And that we need God's righteousness and that his judgment will come whether we want to or not. Those things are true. And when someone already comes to salvation, those are the three things they realize. I am wrong with God. I am a sinner. In fact, that's one of the things they make you pray when you come up front. Dear God, I, I, I realize and know today, I'm convinced that I am a sinner. Please come into my life and give me righteousness. Because I know Jesus Christ is coming back and I know your judgment will come. So the job of the Holy Spirit, the mission of the Holy Spirit is to convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But two things I want to emphasize in, on, in this just this one verse. Let me ask you this question. If men were not totally depraved, because that's what we started with, right? That some people say men are not totally depraved, that we can come to Christ on our own. Right. Or when the call make, it is us who respond to it. And, we are, and we, we are able to respond to the gospel on our own. Why would the Holy Spirit have to, have to be sent into the world to convict men of sin or righteousness and judgment? If we can do it our, in our own, why would he have to be sent to the world to do it? Have you ever thought about that? Well, maybe they think that he, because he's sent into the world and convicts them, then on their own, they, I mean, I, I guess it doesn't really make sense. Well, it wouldn't make sense. You're not on your own if he convicted if you. If he's the one who convicted you to do it. And that's exactly what it is. So that's the mission of the Holy Spirit. And anytime someone who says they are a Christian or a preacher or a teacher says that you can come to Christ on, our, on your own, he's saying that the Holy Spirit is not doing its work. His work. Because the mission, the sole mission of the Holy Spirit, well, it's two missions. You will find, and I think the next one you will find it, to convict the world of, of its sin, righteousness, and judgment, and then to preserve the sin. 
afterward. Remember Jesus praying to the Father? Father, I pray that you protect them. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to protect those who are saved until the glorification. So the Holy Spirit have two jobs on earth. His first mission is to convict us of sin, of, of righteousness and judgment, and then to preserve us until, the and until we get to glory. And that's when we will be talking about eternal security. So that's the first one. Why would the Holy Spirit have to come to convict us if we can, convict, if we can convince ourselves? No criminal, no criminal walks into the courtroom and says, Judge, I want to be convicted. And not, they didn't get arrested or anything. I did something 10 years ago. I want to be convicted. I want to be on death row. Well, somebody had to toll on you or they had to see it, the evidence had to be there, the police had to arrest you and drag you to, to court, uh, um, to, 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 to prison and then to jail, and then, and then they have to bring you to court and the, and the, and the judge convict you. But no, no criminal goes to see a judge and say, I deserve you know, to be convicted. Secondly, the, we can also see here in this very verse, that the word word, the word world, cannot mean everyone without exception, as we've been talking about John 3, 16. Even with here, John, um, John 6, 8, prove again that the word world here cannot mean everyone without exception. Because we know that not everyone in this world will be convicted of sin. Do we agree with that? I think every Christian agree with that unless you are a universalist. Mm -hmm. The church, the universalist church that says, at the end, everyone will be saved anyway. But the Bible clearly teaches that, and we all agree that not everyone will go to heaven. So if, if the mission of the Holy Spirit is to come and convict the world without exception, If one person goes to hell, the Trinity, not just the Holy Spirit, the Trinity fell. Mission aborted. If that was the reason he came, for the world without exception. But when it says that the Holy Spirit come uh, to convict the world, he's talking about the world not without exception, but the world without distinction. Meaning, it's not just the Jews who will be saved, but the Gentiles also from everywhere. No matter where you're from, they are Russian Christians, they are Chinese Christians, they are American Christians, they are Zimbabwean Christians. Wherever you go in the world, you will find the elect. So he comes to convict the world without distinction, not the world without exception. Because if the Holy Spirit came to convict the world without exception instead of without distinction, then if one person is not convicted and go to hell, mission aborted, the Holy Spirit failed. And not just the Holy Spirit, the Son fell, not just the Son, the Father fell. I see some stuff on the screen. Is anybody asking a question? Okay, does he still have a question? I'd love to hear. Hey, G. Um, um, do you have, go, go ahead, you could ask your question. Yes, sir, I didn't have a question. I, there was a couple of things that was said that I wanted to chime in on, but I just didn't want to interrupt the flow of what was going on. Go ahead, go, go, um, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, when you go was ahead. talking about the, um, the mission of the Holy Spirit um, yes. and, and, and how, how, would we, how would we need him if, um, 
if he came, how would we know that we're to be convicted? And the one thing that came to my mind is God's word would never return unto him void. Once Jesus said that he was going to send the comforter, once he said that the Holy Spirit would come to judge against sin, against righteousness and, and whatnot, um, that that had to, it had to happen. It's just ingrained in God's word that that would happen without fault. Um, that's one of the things that I was thinking of. No, that's no, all. no. What, hold on for a second. Um, yes, then sir. you can get to the one. I said, the, what I said is, if human beings can be convicted by themselves, yeah. Why does the Holy Spirit have to come? Got you. Okay, okay. The reason All right. the Holy Spirit had to come is because we can't convict ourselves. We can't come to the realization that I'm a sinner. Correct. We can't come to a realization that I need God's righteousness, not my own. We can't realize that, oh, judgment is coming. I need to come into God's um, uh, um, kingdom. There is, you know, though, there is, though, a, a, a sense that, and, and this is going to fly against everything that you're teaching, um, but the work of the Holy Spirit starts long before our conversion. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes. Um, were, were, you, were you here last week? <laughs> I was with you last week. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. the, that's what we, so, so once we get here, we'll talk a, we'll talk a little bit about it again, okay. but that's what we said convert the, the new birth happens yeah. before you believe yes and that's the work of the holy spirit long right. before and so my but the point that i i would try to drive home and i'm probably not going to hit it at all is yeah. when the work begins there is that sense of conviction that sets in the heart of man yes it's not man who 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 uh brings that about it's all the work of god through the holy spirit but there is that inner working where we realize that we are depraved, that we, you know, there's something that got to show us that we're dead to God and we need to be made alive. And I believe that that's all part of the Holy Spirit's work. No, you're saying exactly what I say. All right, I'm going to give you the floor. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I'm saying you're saying exactly what I said. Okay. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. I think last week, right, we talked about we, um, just like Martin Luther said, Martin Luther says, we are justified by what? Grace, through faith. By faith. Faith. He doesn't say we have, we are, we have faith by justification. Right. One precedes the other. You, you get that? Yes, sir. Faith precedes um, justification. Yes. In the same manner, regeneration precedes faith. That's right. You cannot have faith unless you are born again. Mm. So, so, so I, I, I mean, I have that in the Bible study again. I talked talk about it last week. Mm -hmm. The reason is because we have been taught all our lives the wrong way. A lot of us, or most of us. We think it's when we have faith that we are born again. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, it wasn't a command. Right. It was a statement of fact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He, he didn't say you must do this. No, he's saying that's what must happen. <laughs> right? Yeah. To you. Right? So he's not saying that, oh, I commend you. You must be born again before you come and see the kingdom of God. No, no, no. It's not a command. It's the fact of the matter is, Nicodemus, the reason you cannot see the kingdom of God, because you're not born again. If you want to see the, if you, if you, in order for you to see the kingdom of God, there's only one thing that must happen. You must be born again. And guess what? I don't know. The wind blows wherever it blows. It's not something everybody knows. It's what the Holy Spirit chooses. I have mercy on whom I have mercy. The wind mm. blows wherever it blows. Why did he have to say the wind blows wherever it blows? That's exactly what he's saying. In fact, in Ezekiel, when, when God said to, um, when God says to Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? What happened afterward? The Holy Spirit fought a wind and bring life um, to those dry bones. Okay, so so it, so is, do you have another question, Garvin, or another remark? No, not at the moment. No. Okay. <laughs> so what, the what, night's young. So let, me, 
So what we're saying, if the Holy Spirit's mission is to convict the world without exception of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and one person in the world is not convicted and goes to hell, mission is aborted. So we know that the world is not without exception, but the world without distinction. Furthermore, how do we know that? What does Job chapter 42 verse 2 says? And Job chapter 42 says, I know that you can do all things. And listen, that is the last part I want. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. So if God wanted to convict the world without exception, can his purpose be thwarted? Can his will be thwarted? No. What God wants, what God gets. So we know he's not talking about the world without exception. We know he's talking about the world, therefore, the world without distinction. Moreover, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart if we believe men can, if we believe men can refuse God, that he, the man he calls can refuse him. Many are the plans in the man's heart. But in the, in the end, God's purpose, God's will prevails. So if it was, if men were able to resist this grace, resist this purpose of God, resist the salvific plan of God. No man can, Job chapter 42 says, no, one, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. In, jo, in, 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 in Job, um, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21 says, the Lord's purpose always prevails. Meaning God will, would have override that person. Like Apostle Paul, we looked at last week. Now, we can't, you can't argue that God did not override Apostle Paul's um, heart. You can't argue that. If you argue anything, this is black and white, people. You can't argue that one. Because Apostle Paul was not on the way to think about the gospel, to see how it looks. Maybe it might be good. I don't know. Let me see. I've been against it, but let me go take a last look. No, he was going to arrest them, put them in jail. Yes, sir. I know that this is a little bit off topic, mm -hmm. or, but it seems to kind of fall into that whole thing about um, the name it and claim it movement. Okay. To me, it's, you know, the one thing I've always kind of not liked about that is that it kind of ignores the fact that God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. And this verse kind of says, it, God is sovereign. You can't move the hand of God if the hand of God does not want to be moved. No, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You can't move the hands of God if the God's hands don't want to be moved. I agree. Some people say, well, there was a book. I mean, I've read some crazy books. You know, and in and, and I and, and, and at that time in my life, I was searching for God. And, you know, I, there was a book I read, I Have Faith in Your Faith. Have faith in your faith. It was almost like, believe in what you believe in, it will come to pass. Yeah, that's almost making you a mini God. Yeah. Right? Have Putting faith your in own your, faith as the God. Have faith in your faith. And it was the sound fascinating, uh, you know, at first. And, but when you start reading, you're like, huh? Huh? You know, so, so yeah, so God's will prevail. And it is for this same reason that when we discuss um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Remember 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9? Now we can be certain which, when God says that, when it says, which says that God's will is not that any should perish. We, we are certain because of John, because of, because of what Jesus just said about the Holy Spirit come to convict the world. And we know that if he came to convict the world, that the world must be convicted. Right? 
So, so we said, uh, it, God, it is God's will that it's not God's will that any should perish, that God is not talking with, about, uh, about this any without exception. It's not any without exception. It, it, if it was his will, decretive will, that any without exception would not perish, his will will prevail and none would perish. But it is because God's will in First Peter, even though we have already made it clear, I just want to reemphasize that again, that his will, of that, that any he's talking about is the elect. And since his will always prevail, that's why we said to the elect, God's grace is irresistible. It is effectual. Yes. Uh huh. What does it say? First Peter three nine. Huh? Hold on, Garvel, for a second. Oh, try Second Peter nine and see. Maybe I made a mistake here. Go ahead, Garvel, while Colin is looking. Uh, one of the things that I was just thinking about when um, Mike said what he said is um, I thought to myself, the whole of scripture is about the promises of God to man. It's about uh, God's redeeming work, redeeming us back um, into the fellowship, right? In that, there are a bunch of promises that are laid out for us. We're encouraged to pray back God's word, and you've said it as well, pray God's words back to him. So in essence, I'm taking a little twist, and this is totally off topic, but in essence, when you're praying God's words back to him, if you're claiming or, 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 or standing on a promise of something that you read, that you feel the Holy Spirit is encouraging you to stand on that, then you're speaking God's words back to him. Is, isn't that um, not the whole name and claim it? I'm not trying to go there, but just standing on a promise and believing God for something. Yeah, but but then that would be two different. Yeah, um, I don't think I, I don't think I asked it. I don't think I asked the question with enough clarity. But I, I don't know if you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. No, no, I see what you're saying, and that's the reason I'm saying that's two different things, right? Okay, okay, uh, okay. Mike, Mike is not talking about what God promised. Okay. If I promise you a hundred dollars, then you could come and ask me for it. Okay. But you can't tell me because because you know <laughs> I have. Because you know I'm a millionaire, and that's what those basketball players or those sport guys complain about all the time. Once yes. they become millionaire, they have family coming out of the woods, <laughs> asking right. their money, and they always think they should give it to them. Like right. because you have whatever I ask, because I'm family, you should be able to give me. Right? Gotcha. And it's almost it's almost the same thing when a Christian, you know, says, Well, I can name anything and claim it, and God will give it to me. Mm. Okay, yeah, I'm Mike, go, ahead. go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I, I mean, what, how I've heard it explained, or how I've, and I've done a lot of research on it and read it, a lot of it is almost looking for the perfect formula that will move the hand of God, regardless of what you understand as God's word. You know, like, um, Janis Joplin's song, Oh Lord, why don't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? It's not that you're following God's promises. It's that you're believing that, you know, anything like you can take anything out of context in scripture and then claim that and then believe that God will, if you believe enough, then God will fulfill it. Yeah, I think that's the word. If you believe enough. But it's not what God wills to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, Colleen. Um, um, it's Second Peter. It's not First Peter. I said Second Peter. It's Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine, which is what you could read it. Where's your microphone? Yeah, it's on. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, uh -huh. as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Yes. 
And, and we said, remember, we went back to the context that he's talking to those Christians who were, remember, the book of Peter's book is about suffering, the suffering sense. They were in tribulation. They were under constant, um, um, constant, give me the word, constant attack, constant persecution. And then, and then, and then some people were saying, ah, Christ is not coming back. You're wasting your time. You're suffering for no reason. And Peter's writing to them and says, hey, you're thinking God is slow to his promise. God is not slow to his promise as you think. The reason why is because, and you're going to, and I'm going to make sure that you see why God, God is, God looks slow to his promise. Then, then to say that, that he's not willing that any should perish. It, we, we're going to see that later on. I don't want to say it now. That any should perish, right? That all would come. And I will address that part again in the Bible study, right? So, so yeah, so as we say that, we know that any is not everyone. It's not, without everyone is not the exception, but the elect. And then since God's will, again, as I said, cannot, will prevail, cannot be thwarted, the elect, the, his grace to the one he calls, his call has to be effectual. It has to be effective. It must do what he sent it out. In fact, in fact, Garvel just, just, just quote a verse, which I never plan on quoting, that, you know, when God said out his word, it does not come back to him empty. If God were to call you, how can he come back empty and you not come into him? If his word does not come to him back, empty. So we said the first reason God's call is irresistible is because no plan of his can be thwarted. His will always prevails. So that's the first reason. But we're going to give a second reason. The second reason God's call. So, so because the reason why I'm giving you the other reason is because the first reason sounds more like, I know God is sovereign, but sounds more like a dictator, right? I could just override your will, right? If it was just that, then, whoa, God, you're a dictator. You just do whatever you want, even when I don't want, right? But there's a second reason God's will is, is irresistible to the elect. It's because of what Jesus says in John 10, chapter 11. It is because he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. What does John 10, chapter 11 say? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lay down his life for the sheep. So if I were to just read the first part, I am the good shepherd. What would be my question? What is so good about the, the shepherd? He lays down his life for the sheep. And unlike the hired hen, the good shepherd cares for his sheep. And his sheep knows it. And because his sheep knows it, not only the sheep knows that he cares for them, he lay down his life, and he will never abandon them. And they know that. That's why they come to the shepherd when he's called. I told you about this dog that my neighbors have. He does it every day this week. I'm not his owner, but every time Lucy, well, her owner, Lucy's a girl. Every time Lucy sees me, she jumps. She jumps because we have that relationship. If I'm in my yard working, Lucy's in her yard. And she knows she has that invisible fence. She can't come anymore. She used to come for me to pat her and then she goes. But now she's, until I go to her, she will not come. Because she knows I will pat her. I will, I will play with her a bit. So the shepherd, the, the sheep knows that this, this shepherd will die for me. This shepherd cares for me. This shepherd will never abandon me. That's why the sheep come. That's why it's easy to come to this shepherd. Okay? Um, listen to what Jesus says. And the reason I took this in verse 12 and 13. 
He says, the good shepherd is not the hired, the hired hen. The hired hen is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So you see where I get it? The shepherd cares. The shepherd will never leave the sheep, even if it means death. Isn't that the reason why you love Jesus? Isn't it? You know he died for you. You know he will never leave you nor forsake you. And you know he cares about you. So you come every Sunday morning, every Wednesday, or on Monday to say, yes, Lord. From the bottom of my heart to the depths of my soul, yes, Lord. So the third reason God's call is, is irresistible All done. The reason why God's word, God's word, um, God's call is irresistible is what Jesus said. His sheep knows His voice, and to follow Him, His sheep knows His voice. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 3. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep listen to his voice. Do you hear that? He called his own sheep. Who does he call? His own sheep. Now, let me explain this to you a little bit. And I, and I intended to do that. In fact, I intended to read the entire John chapter 10 before I started Bible study. For some reason, I didn't do that. But now listen. And they might still have it today, I don't know. But back in those days, they had what they called the sheep pen. When the shepherd is tired, need a night off to be with his family, or tired, he wants to go to a hotel somewhere to sleep, he usually don't leave his sheep in the out because he knows of the wolf and all. But they had a sheep pen, maybe wall surrounding it, and they had a gate. And then they would bring, all shepherds would bring their, just like when you're going away on vacation, if you have a dog, you bring them to the doggy daycare. So the shepherds will do the same thing. In fact, let me start reading the text now so you could understand what Jesus is saying. Um, so, so Jesus says, starting verse 1, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. So while the sheep, so many sheep from different shepherds, hundreds of shepherds put their sheep in that sheep pen. And some thieves sometimes come to steal the sheep, but they're not going to ring the bell. No, no, no thief ring the bell at your house to come steal they, they try to get in by another way. But Jesus says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Because he knew he has receipts. He knew he has his sheep in there. So he comes by the gate. And the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And that's truly true. That happens. And the sheep listen to his voice. He called his own sheep. Ooh, I'm going to give this up before I talk about it. He called his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, all his own, not the other one, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, virtually I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, 
but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. And he goes in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and he does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons them, the sheep, and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scattered it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand who, and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And guess what? My sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep. Did you hear that? And I'm going to talk about that. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. The Gentiles, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the Haitians, right? the Canadians. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. Maybe that's why he's slow a little bit. But it's not slow as you think to his promise. Because he's not willing that any should perish. So he's waiting for all of them to come. The world in distinctively, the, uh, uh, um, uh, um, without distinction, right? They too will listen to my, they too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life and only to take it up again. Okay, I'm not going to read the rest. I'm going to continue and I'll come back to the rest. Let me go back. So I just wanted to read the entire chap chapter a bit. Uh, now I just did half of it. So you could get an understanding of what I'm saying. So, so God's call is re irresistible. Let me go back to it. Because God will accomplish whatever he sets out to do. His will will always prevail. And no will of it can be thwarted. Right? Secondly, he's the good shepherd who dies for, cares for, and will never abandon his sheep. And his sheep knows that and love him for it and answer when he calls. Thirdly, his sheep knows his voice and they follow him. And guess what? He makes sure they follow him because the text says he leads them out. That's what makes God call effective and irresistible. Okay, so, so, but two things I want to, to make you aware, though, right here. Two things I want you to be aware. Both Jesus' atonement, now pay attention, please. And that's what we've been talking a little bit. Both Jesus' atonement and salvific plan or salvific call or calling, they on, this text proved that they, it is, they are not general. They are specific. Jesus' atonement, as I talked when I was talking about the atonement and, and limited atonement, and his calling are not general. They are specific. Christ's atonement is specific. What did he say? The good shepherd died for who? His for his sheep. Not all the sheep in the sheep pen. It's very specific. He dies for his sheep. The one his father gave him. Remember John 6? All that my father gave me. He dies for who? For his sheep. Not for all sheep. But his sheep. For them he died and only them. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd says he laid down his life. Meaning when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, not a drop of his, of his blood was shed in vain. When people are just saying Jesus died for the world and then uh, not, not, a, not one drop of Jesus' blood was shed in vain. If Jesus died to save the entire world and only the elect are saved, he was shortchanged and overcharged. Remember, he died to pay for propitiation 
you know, appropriation to satisfy the father's wrath. You pay him back. Okay, my life for theirs. No, Jesus received exactly what he came to purchase. And only what he purchased. He did not die for an indiscriminate blob of people. But for specific individual sheep. You know why? He says, he calls them by name. He calls his sheep by what? By their name. By their name. Come on, Colin. <laughs> Come on, Ninji. What are you waiting for, Mike? The verse 3 said, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep listened to his voice. He called his own sheep by name. Very specific. He's not going to call the sheep of the, and the sheep are not mistaken when he calls them by name. Even there were two other sheep that, that have the same name. His sheep knows his voice. And he leads them out. In fact, when we get to verse 22 to 29, we will, we will see how specific Jesus' call is and why some will not believe. The reason why some don't believe is because Jesus' call is very specific. He doesn't call to everybody. Like he make a call to the world and some choose and some don't. No, that's not what John 10 is teaching here. I believe this here ends all the debate as to why some are saved and others not. Okay? Now, Sharon had asked a question not too long ago, and I talked to her about it a little bit. I kind of knew the answer, but I just didn't want to give the answer, like, specifically, because I knew that I wanted to get here with it. I didn't want to waste the Bible study a little bit. I kind of gave her an answer, but I still held back. Remember when I asked Sharon, why are you, why you believe in your next door neighbor doesn't? Don't, right? Remember? Yeah. Well, Jesus tells us why. He tells us why in John 10, verse 22, 29. Then came the festival of the dedication of Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's col colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, say, around him and saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, man, just, just tell us plainly. Why do you have to give us, um, you know, parables and all this? Just tell us. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. Oh, you do not believe. Oh, why did some believe and some did not believe? Why did, why did the tax collector, Simon, believe? And the Pharisees who are walking a straight line with God, as they thought, did not believe. But you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe. Why you do not believe? What does it say? Because you are not my sheep. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. So when somebody tell, why don't someone believe in Jesus Christ? Because they are not his sheep. He did not atone for them. He did not die for them. They don't belong to him. His father didn't give them to, them, to him. My sheep, listen to my voice. If you were my sheep, you would listen to my voice. I know my sheep, and guess what? My call is irresistible, and they follow me. Those who resist God's call are not his sheep. And the reason they are not his sheep is because he did not atone for them. He died to atone for his sheep. Not one blood of his was shed in vain. He died specifically for his sheep, and he called his sheep by name. Yes, Colleen? Um, it, 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 this brings me back to some days ago. I think it brings me back to um, a conversation that I had with 
Did are you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's good. So um, it reminds me. It reminded me of a conversation that I had with someone a long time ago, a while back. Someone wanted to know that who did not, who is not part of a faith. They, they, we were having a conversation, and they wanted to know how would it be possible for someone like Hitler, or say, because it was an exact conversation, to pop to be saved if they accept Christ. They said if they accept Christ, as we know, mm -hmm. Christ, as you call you, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. before they die. And I said it's simple because if it isn't God's will for them to be saved, it doesn't matter what they did in their past. At the very point of death, they're going to accept Christ and they will be saved. And the person couldn't understand that. Like, how can someone who's done so much wrong possibly be saved? Yeah, because it's not about you. Right. It's not about him. And think of the thief on the cross. It doesn't tell us what his crime was. Yeah. And Jesus still said, because of his faith, this day, and, and if he hadn't been called, he, wouldn't have, he would have been like the other thief, mocking him. Mm -hmm. Who, who wasn't called. He, his eyes weren't open. He didn't know. So we don't know how bad that thief was. And Jesus still said, I'll see you this day in yeah, paradise. Today you are with me. Yeah. yeah. And today you are with me in paradise. Yes, Michael, what happened? Garvel, go ahead, my man. Yes, sir. So um, as Carleen was talking, one of the things I thought of is how we as people try to humanize God because we know we would never allow a Hitler into our heaven. So oh. how in all of the world would God allow Hitler into his heaven? And yeah. that's where we kind of falter when we're trying to fully understand the grace of God. Um, and then the other, the other side of that coin is, you know, we don't know in, in, in uh, eternity past uh, persons who's done wrong or whatever, um, where they wound up because we don't know what, what was on that man's heart. I know that there were Christians in his, not in his circle, but around him. And, you know, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, we don't know. And no one knows, right? No one knows but the Father and, and the Holy Spirit and the Son. But what we're saying is that, it, again, um, I, you said something here, Gavel, and, 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 and the answer I would give him is the answer that Apostle Paul gives. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have mercy. Mercy is undeserved. Is there anyone more undeserving? What did Hitler do that Apostle Paul didn't do? Hmm. You could, you could tell me he did it in larger, whatever. What, really? One, you kill one person, what's the difference? He was there giving, giving authority to kill uh, uh, Stefan, Stephen. Right? Yeah. So I had one more for you, Pastor. Uh-huh. Uh, Revelation 3.20, when the Lord said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone mm -hmm. hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter in and, and eat with them. What do we do with verses like that when we're saying that, um, you know, nobody can answer the call of God. It's only by his will. Um, that's one question. The, mm -hmm. other, the other question that I had, if I can give it to you really quickly, is as you were speaking about uh, G, uh, the sheep knowing the shepherd's voice. If we are dead, which we are, how can we answer his voice? How can we hear his voice? Um, there's a disconnect in what you're teaching us. No. Again, I know you're going to make the connection. I'm just saying, <laughs> in my yeah. mind, there's a disconnect. <laughs> but again, I want you to pay attention to last week. And there's a reason why this is two parts. And, I, and what I just said again, what happened, what happened first, faith or regeneration? Uh, regeneration first. You must be born again. Yes. If you're not born again, you cannot hear his call. Correct. That's why you must be born again. Okay. To have faith. 
It is by um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And that mm -hmm. is not of you. It is the gift of God to have yes. that faith. Yes, yes. So I guess my, 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 it's not even an issue. Where I'm trying to make this full circle connection is, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, with billions, billions of people in the earth, we don't know who are chosen and who's not. That's no. why, that's why the Lord said, go in, uh, into all the earth and preach. Um, exactly. And we do the best we can when we can. Um, for myself, I try not to. I understand that for a lot of people that we come across on a day to day, they want nothing to do with Christians because of people's uh, zealous ways and lack of proper training to not win souls, but 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 to uh, admit, uh, minister the gospel. You know what I'm saying? And so it yeah. turns a lot of people off. So here comes a here comes a, a Mike or, or or a Becky or a or a Jen, and they they begin to open their mouth, and people won't even give him an inkling of an ear because of you know Pastor James last week told him something and they didn't like it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but guess what, Garvel? It, it, it doesn't. But yes, we. We would love to help people and train people that people that they know they have, because Pastor Paul says our our, our job our, our call is to persuade men, right? Correct. So when correct. you talk about persuasion, there's a way of doing it, right? Yes. However, yes. however, it doesn't matter how the Pastor Paul says some preach Christ out right. of um, um, selfish ambition, either way, mm -hmm. right? And some mm -hmm. preach Christ wrongly. Yeah. <laughs> or badly. Um, yeah. It's all know, about wrongly, the end result. But Christ is preach. Right. Christ is preach. And the person who knows the sheep that knows God's voice, it may come the wrong way. It come. It may come rude, like you, brother vipers, like <laughs> like John the Baptist was calling the people when he was preaching. The sheep will know his voice. And it's not about the deliverer. The outcome is not about the way it was delivered. It's only about God's calling. God's so calling. if he chooses to use that bad moment of really bad evangelism to happen to open that person's eyes or ears, he will. It Definitely. doesn't matter how great we are. And I'm not going to say we shouldn't try to yeah, yeah. be good. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I know one thing in my life that I came to this conclusion of constantly trying to evangelize my own mother was, and I, you know, I had said this, you, they don't know how much, they don't care how much you know until yeah. they know how much you care. And for yeah. me, evangelism was, it needs to be personal because you can't just go out, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you to strangers and expect a response. But well, what I realized through what, uh -huh. this Bible study uh -huh. was that he could use yeah. any means, <laughs> yeah. any means to open someone else's eyes because it's not about me and the way I evangelize. It's purely about him, his calling. And also, Pastor James, I think one of the reasons we all keep asking these questions is because throughout these 10 weeks, you have upside down completely my Amen. understanding <laughs> of what it means to be born again. I thought born again was a verb. I thought born again was something you had to do. I thought faith came first and then you would confess your sins. And, and I had been loving God as a young child, but never told you must say the sinner's prayer until I was a teenager. And I thought, oh, I wasn't saved. I wasn't born again because I never said the sinner's prayer, even mm -hmm. though I had loved God younger than that, because I didn't understand what born again, you must be born again, really truly means. Yeah, and if there was a specific sin of prayer that you had to say, it would be in the Bible. Right. Trust me. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, you could. When they talk about, you know, somebody uh, being really hard when you do preach to them, sometimes those are the people that are fighting and working things out and they just don't want to hear. They yeah. Hear. Sometimes it's what you're saying. Sometimes it's not the deliverer. Right. Sometimes some people just. They're, they're fighting against. The yeah. Conviction is starting to go on into their heart. And. That happens as well. You just not keep on, but you just mm -hmm. keep dropping it at the right time. God will give you that. Yes. Moment. It can't. There, are, there is the time where people can do it the wrong way. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and but the other time it's not the person who did it the wrong way, it's the person who's fighting against it. However, God will use every situation, He works all things together for the good, right? For the good. 
for those who are called according to his name, right? According to his purpose, okay? So now we can get back again to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And it gets even clearer because I'm going to talk to you about something when, when it is says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. When we're talking about the patience of God, right? When Peter was saying that, it's not because God, um, you know, is slow in his promise. But why, why is God waiting? Why didn't Jesus Christ come when the saints were suffering around Peter's son? Because he had other sheep and other sheepmen that was not of that sheepmen. Like me, like you, like Garvel, like Kelly, Kelly, Kelly. Kelly. He says in John 10, verse 16, I have other sheep. That are not of his sheep pen, of, of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. <laughs> Meaning it doesn't matter where the sheep come from. Right. It matters that they are my yeah. sheep. Yeah. Here you are in Israel. You are of this sheep pen, but you don't know my voice because you're not my sheep, he said to the, to the Pharisees. But my sheep that are in the other sheep pen, that are Muslim, in the Muslim world, those that God wants to save will save. Those that are in, in India that are serving the thousands of gods, those that are God's sheep will answer to his call. Those that are in Zimbabwe or wherever. Um, I play chess online, and now I'm learning about so many countries I've never heard of. Okay? And I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. I never heard of that country before. Okay? And God has his sheep in those sheep pen. And when he calls, his voice will be effectual. They will listen to his voice. And they will come and become one flock. Because there's neither Jew nor Greek. No woman, no man, slave or free, but all is, will be one flock. Reach or poor, one flock. But the question again, I think that's what Garvel was asking, and I think I started talking about last week. How does the Holy Spirit accomplish his mission of convicting those sheep? He does it through the new birth. You must be born again, which is regeneration. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And except a person is born of water and of spirit, he cannot, she cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. I want this, I want you to remember this. I want this to be engraved in your mind and in your heart. You must be born again is not a command. It's a statement of fact. You must, if you are, if your eyes are to be open, if your ears are to be open to Jesus' calling, you must be born again. There is no way. In fact, it's the miracle of life. The miracle of life. Now, let me ask you this question. What have you done? What did you do to be born physically? What did you do? Absolutely nothing. Your mom did all the work. Not lying, okay? <laughs> I've had four kids. They did nothing, okay? And, and last week, <laughs> and last week I talked about, and your parents did it for their own pleasure. All right? The wind blows wherever it pleases, right? So you did nothing. You just find out that you're born. In fact, the reason why a kid who is adopted gets so upset when they become older 
when they find out their parents are not their parents? It's because you don't even know if your parents are your parents. They just told you they're your parents. You accept that. Why do you accept that? They take care of you. They would die for you. You've, you knew their voice since the bellies. My sheep knows my voice. My children knows my voice. And they follow me. I mean, this is not anything biblical, what have you. There's a way you raise your children, right? I used to go to the Y all the time. And it used to bother me 100%. When those parents telling their children, okay, it's time to go. Like, no, no, you got to wait 15 minutes. And 15 minutes fast. Oh, no, 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 I'm not going now. You got to wait an hour. I'm like, man, if my mother was here, <laughs> you know? And then, and then I would just tell Isaiah, you have five minutes. And then after five, four, four minutes, Isaiah started putting his bag together. He's going. And I had a friend. He's been to the church. And I have some other people because our kids used to play together. He's like, how do you do this? How do you tell him? It's time to go. And he never argues with you. Why my son always argue with me? I said, listen, man, it all has to do with consistency. Your kid knows your voice. He knows if he does it, he might never come back to the Y. He might never come back to the Y. Because that's what's going to happen. So when he hears my voice, he listens. So, 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 so that when we talk about the sheep knows the voice, the children knows the mother's voice, the parent's voice, it has to do a lot with consistency. And I always tell parents this, in my house, if I know I'm tired and I'm not going to do what I say I'm going to do, they could break the house apart. I will not say a word. Because the moment I say something, I have to get up and reinforce it. Right. They go, how did you let them do all that? I didn't feel like going through it. <laughs> because the moment I say it, they will have to do it. Right? So the sheep knows his voice. The sheep knows his voice. Can you, I didn't put that in my text, but can you guys turn, those of you at home, if you have a Bible with you, can you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3? Actually, yeah, we'll go to 4. And until 5. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll continue after 5. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go to seven. First Peter chapter one, verse three. First Peter chapter one. Listen to this. And, I, and sometimes I'm saying, when I discovered this thing, I said, what was I doing with the word of God? Was I reading it? Was I really paying attention? Because if we truly sit down and read the word of God, a lot of things we learn, or sometimes we read it and just go over it. You know why? It's because a lot of us read the word of God just to get something out of it right now. But not to enrich ourselves with it. Listen to what Pete, 1 Peter chapter 1 says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to it. I, oh, I just spoke Creole. I said, listen, we? <laughs> I said, yes, listen. Listen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's stop there. He has given us what? New birth. New birth. You must be born again. Who does it? Does. It's not a command. It's a statement of fact. Blessed be, praise be the God and Father of, Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us 
new birth into a living hope. So who give us the new birth? God does, not us. We have done nothing. And then in verse 4, he says, and into an inheritance. What is an inheritance? Inheritance is something that is given to you. You don't work for an inher inheritance. And an inheritance that can what? That's for, that's for the next Bible study. Can never perish. Because when Jesus gives life, he gives eternal life. There's no way in the Bible. What I'm talking about, you can lose your salvation. There's no way in the Bible that God has never given anyone new life that it was permit, uh, 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 um, temporary. temporary life. It was always eternal life. How can you lose something that is eternal? But give us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. How, how can you lose something you don't have possession of? Yeah. <laughs> it, listen to where the inheritance is kept where? In heaven. In heaven. It's in a safe. <laughs> it's well protected by God in heaven. How can you lose it? Well, well uh, let me not go into Bible study, the next two Bible study. That's why it's not in your hand. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's not in your hand. The inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And who through faith or what? Who through faith or what? Or shielded by? Oh, no, no, no. Who through faith? You kept it. You say, I, I'm staying a Christian no matter. No, no, no. Shielded by God's power. When? For a year? For 10? For 30, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Mm -hmm. Then you'll be glorified. In all this, you greatly rejoice, don't you? Through now for a little while. Remember, that's the first book, right? The first book of Peter. For, and now for a little while, you, have, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that, so that the proving genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The funny thing about it is that all the preachers often criticize the lyrics of songs. Some of our songs have better theologies than our sermons. Some of our songs have better theology. Because most of our song tells us um, that we have nothing to do with our salvation. It is God who's keeping us. But sometimes I'm not, that's not what our preaching is saying. That for you, see the, for you to see the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit will, must regenerate your heart. For you to see the kingdom of God, to be able to believe, to have faith, the Holy Spirit must first give birth give new birth to you. You know why? Flesh give birth to flesh. But it is the Holy Spirit who gives birth to your spirit. That's why, and just, just see it. You see, 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 the, see, see what happened here. In Romans chapter 8, verse 30. And those he predestined, right? Remember, he prepared us into, those he predestined, what does he do? He also called. And who's doing all of it? And those who predestined you? He. He also, but it is that he who also what? Call. What is that call? Regeneration. 
And he who called you, those he called, he also do what? He justified. And those he justified, guess what? He will also glorify from first to last. It is he who is working. It is he who is working. So why regeneration? Regeneration changes the inclination and disposition of our heart. In regeneration, God takes our unbelieving heart of stone and replaces it with a believe heart, believing heart of flesh. Isn't it what I, Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 says? I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. No, no. It never says that when you, when you take away your heart of stone, I will give you a heart of flesh. No, no. I will do it. Just like he did it in Romans chapter 8. He's doing it in Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart. Not you. And put, I will put a new spirit in you. Meaning I will breathe in your nostril again like I did the first time. A new spirit. I, I will remove from you your heart of stone. And I will give you a heart of flesh. My God, it's I, 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 not we. When you, I will. Which in turn makes us more willing not to be dragged, but run and embrace Christ willfully, remorsefully, and joyfully. It is by grace that we have been saved. Ephesians chapter 2. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith. In, in that verse is a little bit unclear when you don't have those reference. It is by grace that they, they think that it is through faith that you have been saved. That when saying faith must happen first, so that for you to know. You see, but you see how the text put it? It is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. Oh, but let me go back to let you know it is not of you. That faith, that, that faith to be born again, that faith to believe in Jesus Christ, it is not of you. It is the gift of, why is that? So that no one can boast. No one can say I had something to do with you. And that's the only gospel that, that turns into a doxology. An outburst of praise to God because you know he did it all. In regeneration, God grants us the gift of repentance and faith, which enables us to believe that we are sinners. Jesus Christ is Lord and God's judgment is coming. The reason it is hard to understand the doctrine of irresistible grace is that we were taught all our lives that faith comes before regeneration, that we believe before we are born again. And this could not be further from the truth. In John, John 6, verse 37, what does Jesus say? All that the Father gives me will come to me. Did you hear that? All that my father gives me, not all without exception, but all without this, all that he gives me, not all that exists, but that all that he gives me will come to me. Note that we were giving to the son before we came to the son. Did you, do you understand that? We were giving to Jesus before we came to Jesus. We were his possession before we even come to him. Before, existed. before we existed. We belong to him, not because we responded to the call, but because we were predestined to come to him before the creation of the world. And those again he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justify, he will also glorify. In fact, if you understand the Bible, 
You only respond to the call because the Holy Spirit gives new birth to you, which enable you to respond to the call of faith. And now you are justified. You can live right now as if you're already in heaven. Because you are, that's what justify means. You are acceptable to God. That's what both justify and righteous mean. You are, now you are acceptable to God. God said, you belong in this, in my family. You can come. His doctrine stands behind the doctrines of limited atonement. That the sheep only die, the shepherd only die for his shepherd. And call his sheep by name. And they know his voice. And his voice is irresistible. The Holy Spirit came to convict the elect of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And to turn us to the Son. To turn all of us whom the Father gave to the Son to the Son. And at the divinely appointed time, the Spirit removed from each elect person his unbelieving heart of stone, hardened and dead in sin. He replaces it with a believing heart of flesh, responsive and alive to God. The Spirit implants, listen, the Spirit implants eternal life within the spiritual dead soul. He grants the chosen man and woman the gift of repentance and faith and enabling and enabling and 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 and, 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 and us um, to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And guess what happened? The moment that happens, suddenly all things are made new. All things are made new. You were resisting God, you're no longer resisting him. You were you were hostile toward him, you're no longer hostile toward him. You were kicking and screaming, now you're running to him. New life from the Spirit produce new love for God. New desires to obey the word of God. And pursuit of holiness. There's a new life direction. Live with new passion for God. These born again ones give evidence of their election with the fruit of righteousness. And this call from the Holy Spirit is effectual. It's irresistible. Meaning the elect will certainly respond when it is given. They will not resist. He doesn't have to take them in kicking and screaming because they have, their heart have been regenerated. They have been born again. And now they are ready to answer the call. So next time we get together, we will study the doctrine of eternal security. Now, we are eight minutes past our time. I'll take one or two questions, not more. Or statement or remark. Anyone? Go ahead. So how do you answer people who say that, you know, if you if you were to share the gospel with them and they go, I'm not ready. So are those people people who aren't part of the sheep pan already, or are there people that you know God is still tugging at their heart? Oh, it's just not the time of the call. If they are, if they are part of the sheep, I, I mean, I, I as a kid, I, I mean, I got saved at an early age, but even earlier than that, I, I, I just, I just knew God, but, but, but in my mind, uh, you know. I'll do it later on after I enjoy myself. <laughs> you know, that's what I was thinking. Uh -huh. That's what I was thinking. After I enjoyed myself. Before we went, before we left, sorry, before we left for New York, I was inside of Nordstrom buying a bag of ass. I we met the, the young lady who was helping us. Mm -hmm. And she looked at us, she was like, You guys look happy. And whatever I said, it is but the grace of God. That, you know, that we, are, we have the relationship that we have. And then she was like, oh my God, this is the second time. Because her adopted sister is a Christian. And she's mm -hmm. married to a Christian. And she went on and found that they are the same. Because you can see that they definitely love one another, so on and so forth. So now I'm sharing with her, you know, at the same time. You know, just talking to her about God. Because I'm like, if it wasn't for God, she probably would not be or 
be the way that we are or I love each other when we have issues because I said don't get don't get it wrong you know marital it doesn't matter who's married because all marriages have issues but it is God's grace that keeps us because I put God as the boat that ties us together in our mm-hmm. relationship that is that was my prayer to God before I got married but that would continue to be my prayer then to God and then she went on to say you know I sis- my sister tells me all the time but I meet so many atheists, I don't know how to believe because how can a God, you know, if God is so loving and so this and that, how can he allow mm-hmm. people to go to, go to hell? hell? Yeah, that's- So then it was the perfect time because this is fresh for me so that I can share. So I, I didn't even have to go deep into what we've been learning. So I just looked at her and I said, there is a system in this country, correct? that punishes criminals, right? So yes, I said, when a crime is committed, where does the government send the people who commit the crime? You go, they go to prison. I said, so if men, who is just mere men, just like you and me, can punish you for a crime that they say you committed, whether you committed it or not, Mm -hmm. if God is a holy God, Mm -hmm. he created you, he created this world. He has complete dominion over this world. Why can he, rightfully so, mm-hmm. punish those who sin against him? Mm-hmm. And she looked at me, she goes, oh, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I'm like, it's simple. God is holy. He cannot live in sin. He cannot stand sin. Therefore, he's right in his justice when he punishes us. Mm-hmm. It made sense to her, but at the same time, she's like, well, I meet so many atheists, I don't know what to believe. So I gave her the, the site. Yeah, to- but what I, what I would love, I, I think this is great, but at the end, I said, but you don't have to. Oh, no. Right? You don't have to. He's offering his grace to you right now. Right. Right? But yeah. Speaking, but to, to what I want to add to it, that was after I was done speaking to him, my husband being the ever so loving man that he is, he goes, yeah, but you have to um come to terms with, you know, you have to, you have to come to terms with your, who you are, your decision. Mm-hmm. I mean, great, logic, you know, unless you're thinking logical in, mm-hmm. in a earthly setting. It makes sense. Okay, mm-hmm. you have to come to terms with who you are, like you said. Mm-hmm. But when you're away from her, and I'm just like, no, honey, you don't have to come to terms with who you are. Because God already knows who you are. Yeah. You're going through and through. Yeah. So but, you're either going to. Yeah. Follow but but this is not but this is not the first time we've heard this, right? Uh, uh, I can't do it right now. But how can God? When when the factual call of God come, and then sometimes God may do it in increments, right? You talk to her, her sister talk to her, and so on, until God gets her to a place to do it, and perhaps she's. She's refusing to come to God. And sometimes that might be years in between too. Yeah. It might not necessarily be an instant change. Yeah. Like you describe what it's like turning 16 mm-hmm. and, and living your life for Christ. Yeah. I would say that's the moment you were justified, not necessarily when God changed your heart. It was, oh, it started. No, because, it did start. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you can't, you, it, if according to what you say, we're dead in our sin mm-hmm. and we we can't desire it, we can't, right? So if we do desire to do right and we do desire to love God, he's already it's changed our heart. He's Spirit. already done it, whether yeah. we've said the sinner's prayer yet or not, yeah. right? Yeah. Whatever. But that wasn't my question. Okay. I, I'll let it go because but, I know you're going to talk about eternal yes, salvation security. next yes, week. So. Remember no, not that next I week. have a question about we, that. We don't have Bible study next week. Oh, sorry. sorry. Next week is the 23rd. Third, yeah. So we have Bible. Whew, we don't have Bible for study for two weeks. Okay. Okay. So we'll come after the year. So I want to see you for Bible study until next year. I, I, I did you, announce that yeah, two wanna, weeks we'd be off. Yeah. I want to give you time to spend with your family and to buy your gifts next week. Um, okay. Mr. G, I have, uh, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, this is agree really quickly, just to what Colleen was saying and to your response to her. Um, in the Corinthians, it talks about one person waters, 
what one, uh, one person plants, one person waters, but it's God who brings the increase. So That's it's true. just, it's, it's all part of the, that work. Yeah. Thank we don't you, know brother. where we are in the process. Yes. Yes. Well, again, thank you guys for coming. Um, thank you for, um, you know, um, you know, study, study the word of God. And, and as your pastor, I just want you to know the word of God, not what I say, but what the Bible says. And I just pray that this Bible study really changes your perception and that you know for sure that you know what you believe, right? Not only you know in whom you believe, but you know what you believe. Let me pray real quickly. Father, we bless your name. We give you praise. We glorify in your name. We thank you for those who are here online and those who are here in person. We pray that you shower your blessing upon them. We pray, oh God, that you continue to regenerate our hearts, oh God, so that we, Father God, can in turn glorify your name and give you praise that you will undeserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. See you next year. <laughs> thank you for the study, Pastor. Yes, sir. Have a good night. All right, you too. All right.